Welcome everybody to the uh, March 9th, 2023 City Council meeting. <clears throat> May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Here. Councilmember Clark. Here. Councilmember Here. Here. Vice Mayor Brown. Here. Mayor Kaiser. Here. And let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and any additions or deletions? Okay, and today we have a presentation, which will be read by me. This is um, the proclamation declaring March 2023 as Red Cross Month, um, which I just said. So uh, during American Red Cross Month, we celebrate humanitarian spirit of Capitola. Caring for one another is at the heart of our community and the people of Capitola exemplify this through their acts of kindness and willingness to volunteer. In Santa Cruz County, local Red Cross volunteers help those in need by assisting during fires, floods, and providing recovery support. Recently, the Red Cross participated in the shelter efforts during the winter storm event. Volunteer support and donations are critical to community resilience. The city recognizes the month of March in honor of all those who fulfill Clara Barton's noble words, you must never think of anything except the need and how to meet it. Therefore, as mayor of the city of Capitola, I proclaim March 2023 as Red Cross Month and encourage all citizens to reach out and support the Red Cross's humanitarian mission. And I welcome anybody to speak on that. <laughs> yeah, you both can say something. <laughs> Do you want to go first? No, no, you go first. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pressure's on. There you go. <laughs> ladies bit, first. Bit. Ladies first. <laughs> okay. I have, I have a written message. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so hello, my name is Jackie Castorena Davila. Uh, I'm an associate board member with the Red Cross, um, and joining me today is Antonio. Um, let's see, it is a great honor to accept this special proclamation uh, declaring March as Red Cross Month. Um, our mission wouldn't be possible without our Red Cross volunteers who make up 90% of our workforce. Um, we honor them as community heroes and celebrate their commitment to support individuals and families in need. Uh, they are a beacon of hope on everyone's darkest days. Um, and I am incredibly, I am incredibly proud uh, to share a few highlights um, of what we've accomplished uh, together in the Central Coast chapter. Um, as many of you know, in January, we responded to one of the worst flooding disasters our area has ever experienced. Um, we are looking at how we can better prepare our communities for new uh, for new, a new pace of disasters we've experienced um, as a result um, of effects of climate change. Um, the Red Cross is committed to doing its part to reduce the current and future humanitarian impacts of climate change globally. Um, over the next several years, the Red Cross aims to grow disaster workforce, strengthen support networks of partners in high-risk communities, um, expand recovery assistance for those with the greatest needs, um, and enhance support services for people who can't return home. The Red Cross is making strategic investments now that will enable us to grow our capacity and adapt our disaster mission to help families and communities better cope with the humanitarian crisis caused by climate change. Um, and I am proud to share uh, that our Central Coast chapter has become a certified green business, um, and it is the first in the nation to accomplish this. Uh, chapters across the nation are inspired to also become green business certified or at the very least adopt the same measures uh, to help the organization reduce our environmental impact across the board. Um, help can't wait during emergencies and that's why the Red Cross steps up to ensure people receive the relief and care that they need. 
Um, every eight minutes, Red Cross volunteers respond to the U.S.'s largest disasters like hurricanes, floods, and wildfires, uh, which have grown in frequency and intensity. Um, as disasters continue to upend lives each day, our volunteers are, are sorry, our volunteer support is critical. Um, the scope and scale of its disaster response was huge. Um, in our chapter area alone during this past uh, January, um, we opened 31 shelters across our three counties in the Monterey Bay area. 82 total shelters opened across the entire response area. Um, and in terms of size and scale of this disaster, if you were to compare it to Hurricane Ian, um, the response in 2022, uh, we opened more shelters than the 74 opened for Ian. Um, this demonstrates the lack of accessibility to the areas affected by these winter storms um, and the importance of Red Cross team members collaborating with our partners to ensure uh, we have shelter sites and plans ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, we are now focusing on the next phase of the response, helping communities affected uh, on the long path to recovery. Uh, we are working with partners in damage assessment and plans to get our community back on its feet again. Um, damage assessments with floods is different than it is with fires as the process uh, for flood inspections takes more time uh, because the damage to the structure isn't as, obvi as obvious as it is with fire. Uh, so each structure must be uh, inspected for damage and reported. Um, every day, people in our community rely on Red Cross volunteers for support. There are many ways you can help your neighbors in need, including uh, through our most needed position of disaster response volunteers. Um, if any of you are interested in volunteer opportunities or just to know what to include in your emergency to-go kit, uh, please visit the redcross.org um, or you can download the app, the Red Cross app, uh, where you can get notifications or, or tips on how to best prepare for an emergency. So on behalf of the American Red Cross, uh, we thank you for this proclamation. Uh, but most of all, we would like to thank you and your city staff members uh, who have worked closely with the Red Cross over the years to prepare for all types of emergencies or future disasters in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very good speech, isn't it? Very good she's speech. Just going, yeah, <laughs> she's um, a UC Berkeley graduate. Well, so it shows. That's great, you know, so, so it's part of our Red Cross. Uh, my name is Antonio Rivas, and uh, I'm part of the executive board of the uh, Central Coast chapter of Red Cross. And most of you know, she said everything that we, we, we do. So. Really, I would really want to thank you for this proclamation, uh, and especially the fire department and the sheriff's department, the police department, everybody and the staff, because I think Capitola suffer a lot. And, and, and we're lucky that we, we got the governor here, we got the, uh, the president here. So, so it's hopefully that all that uh, presence from the government be able to, to give you the money and the funding so you can be able to uh, to be able to do it. the business that it lost a lot of stuff, you know, it's important that we get into it. Um, another thing that's very important is that, because um, a former mayor of the city of Watsonville, I don't know if some of you saw, it is important, like the city of Watsonville also suffered a lot too, but one of the things that really we need is more volunteers. And I really, for the people in the audience, anybody else to try to uh, volunteer for the Red Cross because everything that we do is volunteer and we provide the resources, the funding and everything else to help our communities. It is important to do that. And also blood donations. We need the blood. We need blood. <laughs> so anybody else for you from the city council and everybody from the staff, be sure, you know, whenever we have our blood drive, please volunteer and tell the neighbors and everybody in the community to, because it's a big need. Uh, in a sense of uh, blood donations. So with that in mind, I just really want to thank you for the bottom of my heart for all the things that you do and also the support that you give to the Red Cross. So thank you and um, hopefully no more floods and hopefully we can be able to survive this. I know we have a big storm coming in, but hopefully nothing uh, will jeopardize Capitola or anybody in, the, in our communities. Thank you very much for, for your time. Thank so, you. Yeah. I'll give you the proclamation too. I'll come yeah, out. can we take a picture with all of you together? That would be great. Right, so I'll take a picture. Yeah. I did. 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 I did
Thank you. And what a good time to name March as American Red Cross Month after all we've been through and some other impending things happening. So as a reminder, everybody stay safe. And if you can volunteer, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on. Is there a report on closed session? Good evening, Mayor and community. We had a closed session on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Great, thank you. And additional materials. Great, thank you. Are there any um, oral communications by members of the public? These will be, um, you can speak about anything that's not on the agenda um, or any consent item. I see nobody here. Anybody online? Cool. All right. Any staff comments? I just want to note that we are obviously we are in the middle of a storm event. Uh, city staff has been in close coordination with our regional partners participating in the countywide emergency operations center. We're also monitoring creek flows, the weather, uh, tides. I will share with the community that the high tide this evening is about midnight and then we have another high tide tomorrow night, uh, lower high tide tomorrow at noon and then a high tide at midnight tomorrow night. Those are the times when we get the most concerned about high flows but the good news is that we're not looking at king tides, we're looking at high tides that are sort of well within the normal high tide range. So everyone should be prepared, monitor the weather forecast, and if you need sandbags still, they are available behind City Hall. Thank you. Anybody on council? I do. Yeah. Yeah, as um, many of you recall, just a few years ago, the city of Capitola um, banned flavored tobacco. And just recently, the state of tobacco control 2023 California local grades were released. And um, I want to say in 2018, were maybe a F or a D or something like that. But the good news is <laughs> we, because of that work and our continued efforts and, and our police department essentially um, going out and ensuring that um, that not just flavored tobacco is not sold to our youth, but just making sure all the laws are being abided by, the city of Capitola has earned a grade A. And so we have come a long way and congratulations to our police department and to city council for adopting that um, that just a few years ago. Thank you. That's great news. Thank you. Good update. Yeah. Any other comments? I just have one, um, just a little note. You can mark your calendars that our museum, our Capitola Museum, we're having a grand reopening of a new exhibit. It's called Capitola, Signs of the Times. This will take place on March 18th, starting at 11.30 a.m. till 2 p.m. refreshments and special presentations will be featured. So I encourage people to uh, go on out and check it out. Okay. So then we'll go to consent. Um, and I would like to pull item 8B from the consent items and I'll be looking for a motion on items 8A, 8C, 8D, and 8E. I'll move items 8B, C, D, and E. So, uh, oh, eight, I get eight. A, C, D, and yeah. E. Thank you. Great. Second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Aye. 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 Thank you. And then I will hand the floor over to Vice Mayor Brown. Okay. Um, so I believe item 8B you pulled because you have to I, recuse? I did pull because I have to recuse and I'll okay. tell you why. <laughs> My employer, it's a restaurant called Paradise Beach Grill. They provide sometimes live entertainment and it's located approximately 150 feet from Capitola Bar and Grill. So to avoid any appearance of impropriety or conflict, I'm recusing. Thank you. All right. Do, we need, do you need to leave? 
No? I was okay, told, sorry. scooch back. For My apologies, <laughs> Mayor. Okay, uh, so with that, we will uh, entertain a motion to vote on consent item 8B. I'll move item 8B. I'll second. Approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Thank you. Or er, unanimously with one abstention. Sorry, I wasn't trying to get rid of you. No, <laughs> that's fine. Do you need to leave? I need more steps, anyways, <laughs> today. All right. So we're going to move on to general government. Item 9A. The, um, we're considering changes to administrative policy V18, the outdoor display of governmental and non-governmental flags on city property. The recommended action tonight is to approve the changes to the policy. I um, thought I'd like to maybe add something to that. We were talking about making it six months for the, the appeal process or to bring back that item. Maybe if we can make that to 12 months instead of six months. So are we, we talking about an item within the staff report for this wait they, for 9a is that what we're talking about yeah so i think we're going to go with um staff's presentation first okay. council member yeah. and then Great. well we can thank you it to discussion. out of order sorry no, no. no that's okay it's very exciting i know <laughs> um <laughs> i just okay. tried to get the mayor to leave so you <laughs> 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 i'm out of here the rain Okay, so thank you so much, Mayor and Council. This will be a brief presentation about our current flag policy, and we're doing something a little different. I'm wondering if it's gonna work. Aha, okay. So, background. I might be moving around. Um, in May of 2021, Council did approve the current policy, outdoor display of governmental and non-governmental flags on city property. And since then, Council has approved one of three total requests. And recently, um, in late January, Council did ask staff to bring an updated draft of the policy for your discussion, recommendation, and then hopefully your approval. And I'm not sure I skipped something here. Sorry, everyone. Okay. So our current policy um, states direction for how and when to fly our flags at half staff and also how people can request non-governmental flags flown. And that's just what the current policy is about. And potential changes are, I'm gonna let our clerk move me forward. Thank you. Um, based on Feedback from council and, uh, and some research of regional um, other policies, we made some potential changes in the draft it included in your agenda packet. So the um, changes here, there's two different options. I'll start with the first. Basically, everything stays the same. However, we're um, suggesting that non-governmental flag requests must now, with the changes, be sponsored by a council member and then would be again heard in a public meeting. The flag requested would be the same size as our city flags. That was more of a cleanup item. And as our council member mentioned, a denied request would be reconsidered after one year rather than what is currently in the policy, which is a six month turnaround. So that would be option one. Um, option two would be virtually the same with one added um, level that a, a a request would still be sponsored by a council member, but would require a supermajority vote of council to be approved. That would be four out of five of you um, voting I to fly a flag versus three. So that is your second option. Go ahead, city manager. Excuse me. And that supermajority requirement we found in the city of Watsonville. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And I think the intent behind is just, you know, City moves by a three-two item. It's three -two still on something. Mm -hmm. It signifies a lot of disagreement, and so it's just one factor to consider: is would you want to make sure that you know, at least four of the council members were on board with something like this? Yes. And I should have also mentioned um, both the city of Scotts Valley and the city of Watsonville, their flag policies do already include that a request is sponsored by a city council member. Okay, and those are really the changes um, recommended or up 
up for your discussion. Our next slide is just the recommendation, which is to approve option one or option two or provide more direction. So I'm here for questions. Thank you. Great. Any questions? I have a question. Can mm -hmm. you um, clarify what sponsorship by a council member means? What so basically, process? it would be like council bringing a flag request to staff. So to be more clear, so or a, a member of council. General, so does that mean during a city council meeting at open public comment, a council member would then have to say to staff, this is what I want to do? What's the pr best practice? What protocol are we going to be writing into place to sponsor? I think we could determine a different process, but that is the current process that's probably would be the simplest one to utilize. It's just that a council member would bring it up as you do currently during council comments about a future agenda item to consider. So I know that some of our policies are specific in stating that as the practice. Is this so this would have to be added 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 language to the policy if that's the practice we want to follow instead of just one day that would be, I could include that language and you could just direct that, I think, during the meeting tonight. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Could you go back to, I believe, the second, the second slide? Third slide. Yeah. Um, Pre-approved list of non-governmental flags. Can somebody elaborate on that? Is that, this is our current policy? Yes, yeah, so the policy included in the packet, um, that's like the third page of the policy. Uh, when this was brought to our, our attention early in 2021, uh, council directed a certain flag included already in the policy. So that was what that is. Does that? So <laughs> does this that mean that, that only pre-approved, a flag that's on the pre-approved list of non-governmental flags can be approved? Is that no, what that means? No. Or? What I think it was intended was that if a flag is on the pre-approved list, you don't need to request it oh, every year. Oh, got it. Yeah, and then that was going to be my next question is sense. if uh, council sponsors a flag, mm -hmm. is that an ongoing thing or is that per year and needs to be basically re-sponsored and re-requested each year? I think that would be or included. Each six months or whatever it may be. I believe the way it is now is you, it would be included in your request, right, city manager? Yes. Basically, the frequency of flying and exactly. the duration. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Actually, I do have a question. Yeah. Now that I think about it, mm -hmm. um, is it in our? And forgive me if it is, and I just didn't know. Is it already in our policy for a method of taking a flag off of the pre-approved list? Do we don't, have that in our policy? I right don't now? believe so. No. So that's an interesting question, but I think removing an item from the flight policy, amending the policy, the council could do simply through the verbal agenda. Process. Just same way that we wanted to that sponsor a flag, we would yeah. say I would like to reconsider the policy and, and remove a flag. Okay, I was right. just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any public comment on this item? See none here. Do we have anybody online? Okay, so we can take it back to deliberation. It's already up there. Yeah, Joe, Joe is ahead of the game. He, he had his psychic. I like number two, all the, and adding to what you stated earlier, I think. Option two. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. yeah, so does anybody prefer to make a motion on option one or option two? I'd make a motion for option two, and you're, the verbiage you had in there with sure we'll include the that that um council member brooks mentioned yeah. i'll second great motion and a second may we have a roll call please council member aye council member aye council member aye 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 passes unanimously thank you thank you so much thank you chloe great job and now we have 9b it is our 2023-2024 fiscal federal funding requests. I said that out of order. The recommended action is to consider requests for this fiscal year federal funding. Mayor and Council, first off, I need to apologize a little bit for a bit of a vague agenda item. Um, we were 
been working frantically to try to put something together for your consideration this evening. Uh, the Public Works Director will be presenting a little bit of this, but I want, wanted to provide some background is that um, our congressman has asked the city about whether we would want to request any funding in this next year's budget. We've had conversations with staff for Congressman Panetta's office, and they've encouraged the city to think a little bit hard about, given the recent damage we've sustained, the visits from our governor, from the president, from our congressman, that there was a commitment there about everybody following through and helping capital through these times. So they really have encouraged us to apply. Uh, we've talked to them about a number of different options to apply for, uh, and I think what we're looking for is basically feedback on kind of those asks. Uh, the applications are due next week, so that was the real <laughs> push to get something in front of you this evening. Uh, and one of them is, is kind of a big new project, but I think it really warrants, uh, warrants council's feedback before we submit it up the chain. Anything we submit up the chain, it's got to go through a lot of steps. It has to move through a divided government in Washington, D.C. There's no guarantee we would get this money. I need to be clear about that. But at this point, it's whether or not we should put that request in with Congressman Panetta. I'll turn it over to Jessica. <clears throat> All right. Um, so as city manager summarized, uh, we've been approached by uh, staff of Panetta to submit for the community project funding for this uh, coming year's appropriations bill. The requests are due in the middle of next week. Uh, as a reminder, the city received uh, $3.5 million in this type of funding for the Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Improvement Project. We actually just submitted our paperwork uh, earlier today to receive that money, so that's very exciting. And then any request is not guaranteed to be promoted or the city to be selected for funding, but we do want to put our best foot forward for these projects. So there's several types of funding available here. Um, we have three projects that qualify for three different types of funding. Uh, the first one being the city's community center. Um, so the potential ask for this is about $2 million. This would come out of HUD funding, which is the same type of funding that we are getting for the wharf. Um, it's a more general funding, has less requirements. There's no match requirement. And it would to be fun to fund the renovation of the community center. Um, you may recall that you all um, approved a contract for the design of that project maybe two council meetings ago. We just had our kickoff for that project. Um, there's a pretty wide range of improvements that can be done there. The money we have for this project project uh, for next year's budget, the 1.8 million that has been suggested would cover all of our contractually obligated portions of that project with the school district, but there's opportunity for other uh, interior and exterior improvements, um, particularly for the electrical system out there. So not the prettiest thing, but something that would be definitely needed to improve our HVAC and to have the um, community center work optimally. So that is one potential project we could put in for funding. The second project is the one uh, the city manager referred to, is our Cliff Drive Stabilization and Public Access Project. So in the budget for this year, there is a study for Cliff Drive to uh, assess the stability of the bluff. Um, it's gonna be a pretty daunting project. We've lost part of the bluff during the storms near both of the upper and lower parking areas. The request for this project would be for construction. Um, this would be through FEMA. The maximum request is $10 million, and that's what we would aim to ask for. There's a required match of 25%. Um, the estimate for this total project is $1 million in engineering and environmental costs and $10 million for construction. That's based on a project that's being currently um, constructed in Pismo Beach, so it's actually a pretty reasonable estimate for this type of work. Um, the scope would include the professional and engineering and environmental services, construction for mitigations to stabilize the bluff along Cliff Drive, the repair of the stairs that were also washed away during the storm, and then construction of a pedestrian walkway. Uh, staff has had preliminary conversations with the Coastal Commission and other permitting agencies. Um, nope, nope. I'm looking for the one with the picture, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> uh, on this project. And they suggested to us to really consider the big overall picture. So improving public access. Right now we just have a road shoulder on the side there in addition to stabilizing the bluff for our arterial road. 
Uh, the road is also a seg primary segment of the California Coastal Trail and is documented by the Coastal Conservancy as needing improvement for shoreline access. And it's also identified in the city's hazard mitigation plan as an at-risk facility. Uh, next slide, please. The third project would be a roads project. This would be um, sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration. Um, the request would be for a billion and a half dollars for the uh, 41st Street, 41st Avenue corridor. So the idea here would to have a complete streets plan for the entire uh, 41st Avenue in the city limits, and then have implementation on the south end. So from Capitola Road south to the end of the city limits with the county. Um, this money requires a 25% match, uh, 250,000 in engineering environmental, and then the 1.25 in construction for the lower half. Uh, the idea would be to improve safety for all modes of travel um, and to also implement recommendations of our pavement management program. Um, the overall PCI or pavement, pavement condition index of 41st Avenue is below 50, which is considered poor. Um, I think the average is actually about 47. This is just an example of what a complete streets plan would look like. This is not, I'm not sure what jurisdiction this is, but this is just kind of an example of a, uh, our end product here. Something to manage all modes of travel, including the bus, uh, bikes, pedestrians, to enhance safety and comfort for all users. And really the goal is to encourage economic economic revitalization and reinvestment. Um, so when, if and when the mall ever comes to be, we have a plan that we can provide to developers and to the community of what we really envision uh, 41st Avenue to look like. And with that, I will take any questions on these projects. Thank or Jamie you. may have something to oh, say. Sure. I was going to add a couple things. It, it may have been clear to everybody else, I may have missed it, but, but we're suggesting asking for all three. Um, oh, that's going to be my question. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're suggesting asking for all three. We did talk to Congress, the Congressman's office, and they did say that for items where we would be happy, we'd not be happy, we'd be okay with the amount decreasing. Uh, we were thinking that we would identify maybe like a $7 million floor to the cliff drive funding. And then we were thinking a relatively low floor of the community center funding because it's, you know, it's a project that we need to do and it would be great to get help with it. So it, you don't need to choose between these. The biggest sure. thing is, is that that cliff drive project is big. Uh, we've talked about it in our hazard mitigation plans with for the new council members that we haven't talked about that yet. And the thing, the way I think about that cliff drive is, is that it, it's, you know, we keep losing a foot mm -hmm. here, you know, chunks here and there. And then someday it's going to look like West Cliff and Santa Cruz. And we're going to be talking about one way in the street. And at that point, it'll be too late. So we have a unique opportunity to proactively go after this and figure out a way to keep this important arterial open and hopefully make a much cleaner entry into the village for folks that are approaching by bike and foot. So with the 25% matches that we need for two of those projects, we need like $2.8 million that we would be able to match. Where would that money come from? Well, some of the internal strategy was that was part of the ask for the community center, uh, that if that was funded, we could free up some funding we've already allocated there. Um, and that would help with the bluffs. And then, but yeah, we don't have a firm plan at this point to fund it. I think we would have to figure out. We do also have the road funding this year. You recall that we put a million dollars into roads so if that looked like that was going to be successful we'd use local matches there so the road funding i'm not too worried about the bluffs 25 percent of a 10 million dollar project is a lot of money yeah and so that right. was part of the strategy around the community center and given that we've already put some money in right and then with the roads though if we have one um a million dollars into the roads right now and we take what would what did i just say it would be 300 Three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars is twenty-five percent of one point five million, and we took that away from the roads to get a one point five million dollar grant. It's essentially just putting that same money back into Forty First Avenue and not into the roads that we identified in the budget discussion last week. Is that right? Am I, am I making sense? I think there would need to be some prioritization for sure, um, and I think that actually Lower Forty First was included in the cycle next. A portion of it, yes. A portion of it was. So, but yes, there would be some reprioritization. Um, and realistically, we wouldn't know about this pretty until probably December um, this year. 
So would that mean that any work that we would plan to have done on the roads or the community center would now be on hold until December? Well, we would know if it was submitted before December. So if we were out immediately, we would know. But potentially. Oh, like if, if the congressman actually didn't make the request on our behalf or, okay, I see what you mean. Okay. The, the other option is, is if we're still, if we're still in the mix and we're looking at the pavement <coughs> project and the team is putting it together, what we could do is we can also structure the, the bid so that we, we end up leaving some headroom so that we could add it in down the road potentially if we needed to or take it out. And by that I mean like, you know, we could have a couple of streets that to get us, to keep us, to keep that, um, that extra cash available and then we could add it in if we weren't successful down the road. So I don't think, I don't think that should be a major hang up. But the cliff drive side, mm -hmm. you know, two and a half million is a, is a, a significant money. match. Yeah. It's a significant match. And I think, you know, we would be talking to the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Conservancy, as well as everybody else that we could find about how to, how to close that gap. Okay. Thanks. I had a question about the uh, cliff project. Um, looking at the slide, are they, are they going to do it similar to what the county did in Pleasure Point? And are they going to get rid of the riffraff rocks that uh, are at the foot of, uh, of the cliff? It would need to be designed, but likely, yes, that would be a good comparable project. Yeah, it was nice when they got rid of all the riffraff rock and then put some trails in there, because we've had quite a few people stranded up on the rocks at high tides. And mm -hmm. But they were stranded on top of the rocks because they couldn't get down where they previously? They just were out swimming or caught walking up towards the cliff. They get stuck on the riffraff rocks. And when they b rebuilt there in the county, it was, became a lot safer because people had little go trails to get themselves out. Got it. So I'm just it. curious about the plan. And uh, That would definitely be something we would need to take into account. We, we, it's not too frequent that we have folks trapped this, this side, much more frequent than we get folks trapped over on the depot side during high time, but it happens. It does happen. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious with the 25% matching, um, I think you said you're requesting like $10 million, for example. So is that going to bring the total project budget to $10.25 million? I, th I think yes. it probably would. That's what, I okay. Think probably would. I think we're going to get knocked back probably closer to eight. Right, so then maybe the total project would end yeah. up I mean, it something might close to, okay. Us, it might make more sense for us to ask for eight or nine somewhere in there, but, uh, you know, this is it's a fast-moving uh, target at this point. Um, ten's a good round number. Yeah, ten is a good round number. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the other thing to think about also is, is do you want to go bounce back to the bluff shop? Um, there's some... Where we start and stop the project, um, there's some flexibility there. Right. You know, there's the most urgent areas where you look at it and go, whoa, that's going to be the first spot. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there is some scalability here. To, to do it all the way through here, we think it's closer to 10. Um, but there is some scalability. Oh, and the other thing I guess I should add is, is that realistically, we would find out whether we got this funding and, you know, sort of get the authorization about a year from now. There probably would be almost a year working processes with FEMA and then they want it to fund spent within three years so it isn't as if we have to come up with 2.5 million next week it's mm -hmm. 2.5 million probably four years from now so there is there's some time for us to plan for that. okay and then so so the recommendation is to go for all three and then is there a chance like even Panetta's office or somebody might just come back to us and say like hey you know we've got a lot of requests we need to whittle it down and you guys would just come back to us or and we could decide what we wanted to focus on or I, I, I don't know that that's super likely that it would play out that way okay. I think that it's possible that they would ask us like okay we're comfortable submitting for 700k or something for the community center so Okay. My recommendation would be to give us the authority to apply for all of these guys, and and if at the end of the day they come back and say, you know, you have to choose one of the three, then we can come back. Okay. It, it would be tight. We'd have to probably call a special meeting. Okay. Um, cool. I would also say that these projects come from three different funding sources, so chances of them saying that for uh, comparing our three projects is probably them comparing them against other 
municipalities project okay excuse me and not our own because they are coming from different funding sources okay question yeah so Jessica on the NOFA it states that pretty clear for the community center that it was CDBG dollars but you mentioned HUD have you looked a little bit more closely at that um, I believe HUD had a little bit of a it didn't specify community center. So I guess my question is just rhetorical. Maybe look more closely at that for CDBG more specific because it states community center. Noted. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none here. Anybody online? Thanks. Okay. So we can bring it back to council. Um, I'll make a motion. I don't know what the per correct uh, for staff recommendation that we move forward in making requests for all three projects. I'll second. Great. Motion and a second. Maybe we have a roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, we'll move on to 9C, which is our city council orientation presentation. All right, so this, myself again with this chair. Um, so this item actually was originally planned for I think the second week of the new council's term. And we run, unfortunately, due to weather related, travel related, all sorts of different rule issues. We were unable to get it scheduled until now. So this is typically, put your put your hat back on and imagine this is your second time you've all sat together. <laughs> <laughs> and all the questions you had then, we'll answer now. Um, kidding aside, that, that was actually our original plan. So it's a little awkward, but we're gonna try to move through this stuff relatively quickly. I think it's gonna be broken up between some presentations. I'm gonna make some presentations the city attorney is gonna make manager is going to make and our city clerk so we'll try to keep it interesting uh, as we break between the different items I think it'd be a good opportunity for questions if anybody has any rather than waiting till we get all the way to the end and yeah let's kick it off so this is the overall format um, I'm not going to read it all the way through but the, we're, I promise you that it'll be interesting <laughs> and we will have different speakers so it's not going to be me just talking but I will kick us off and talk about kind of the council manager form of government. And I think most of you are familiar with this, and this is maybe for the community as well, but the council manager form of government is the most common form of government in the state of California. Of the 480 something cities in the state, all but about 10 of them are using the council manager form of government. That cities that don't use what's called a strong mayor form of government. And what that means is the mayor is the CEO. So in those cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, to name a couple, those cities, the mayor is the CEO. The mayor is hiring the department heads. The mayor is hiring the police chief. The mayor is, is, is can veto the rest of the council. Council man, manager form of government is different, is that the city council becomes the board of directors. In the city council, you guys make laws. You guys approve the budget. You guys establish the city's goals and strategic plans. You make the big land use decisions. I am your CEO. I am working for you as you guys are the chair of the board, and I am responsible for implementing your direction. Um, so I don't think I need to go through all the different sort of city manager tasks, but the <laughs> main point is, is that I'm working for you guys, and you guys give direction to me in, open, in a meeting. And that can be an open meeting here, or limited situations, it can be in a closed session, uh, which, which are intended to be specific items allowed to be done, discussions allowed to happen outside of an open council meeting, revolving around personnel matters, litigation, real property negotiations, things like that. Next slide, please. So one of the key things is that that direction comes from the full council. And so individual council members aren't, aren't supposed to go to a police officer and say, hey, give that person a ticket. They've been parking too long. Uh, that direction would come through me at a council meeting by a vote of the city council. That being said, council members are always always empowered to ask questions and 
talk to me offline if you have questions, or talk to my department heads. In general, kind of the rule of thumb is if it's a it's a research question, if it's a couple hours, um, my staff will just get it for you. If it's a full day or two days worth of work, uh, I would strategize with you about how to bring it to the full council for authorization. And I mean, I think everyone can understand sort of the purpose behind this is just so that one council member's pet project doesn't suddenly dominate cities. Realistically, we work for everybody. Uh, and we need to make sure that everybody is on board with what we do. So then I just want to touch really quickly on the org chart. Unfortunately, we got a little cut off down the bottom. <laughs> But basically, you'll see that the city council is up on top. And the city council, you have two hires that you make as a city council. First one is me as a city manager. Or maybe the first one is Samantha as your city attorney. And the second one is me as your city manager. Um, so the city attorney is outside of the city manager's responsibilities. But I am responsible then for hiring and overseeing all the different departments in the city. And we have four different departments, police, community development, each one of them is run by our director of those departments. And then we have the recreation division, uh, which is on its own right now. It's within the city manager's department. Uh, also within the city manager's department, we do HR um, and city work function, information technology. And then in finance, they're responsible for overseeing the accounts payable, uh, making in money, paying the bills, making sure our books are balanced. Public works is kind of divided into general themes. We've got the folks that work in the field, and then we've folks that work in the office of project management team. Community development is divided into two divisions. It's building. Those are the folks that inspect, inspect construction, and they work in the field a lot. And then we have our planners, and those folks are the ones who issue the permits that go to the planning commission. So if you want to build a new big hotel project on 41st Avenue, you'd work with the community development. And then the police department is broken up into, I think we have, I'm looking there, and it's hard for me to see exactly. We have the records division, which is the administrative side of the police department. And we have patrol, which is our officers. And then we also have the parking enforcement division. I didn't think that was within patrol, but it looks like it is on that chart. So I got a little thrown off. But that's the basic structure of the city. Then there's a whole bunch of other things that we do, and we participate with other jurisdictions services, other, participate with other jurisdictions to provide services. So that includes uh, libraries. We partner with uh, the city of Santa Cruz, the county, and Scotts Valley. Our dispatch center, we, we do Watsonville is in, Scotts Valley is out. Uh, animal services, all the cities in the county participate do that jointly. Uh, 3CE, our community power, uh, we are one of the board members there, and that's, that's a entity that goes all the way down to Santa Barbara County. Sanitation and flood control, we partner with our county to provide, the Regional Transportation Commission, uh, and then Metro. So there's a whole bunch of other government services that are provided in the city that you and I, we all sit on the different boards for these entities and we provide them collaboratively with other cities. And Jamie, the reason that we have that, because not all cities are set up like that's so one, because mm -hmm. we're small, but there's a name for it. There's a, what are, we're one type of city versus another type of city. Um, common law? No. I can tell you. General law, no. that's what I meant. <laughs> common law. Charter versus city. Yeah, charter. City. Yeah, charter. We're not married. Yeah. We're not married. <laughs> so con contract versus full service city. Sorry, I don't know if I said that correctly. So a contract city is generally thought of as one that has a lot of contracts for services. You know, it can be like a contract with your sheriff for policing is a really common one. Um, more combination between the two. You know, I think if you look more towards Santa Cruz, they're more of a full service city. They have a fire department, a police department, a water department, all those things. Um, we're not as we're not we're not on the extreme end of a contract city where we really there there are some cities out there that just have an administrative staff and then you manage the contracts with other entities to provide services. And that concludes my portion. Are there any <coughs> questions kind of on the overall form of government, our departments, our organization. Who's our representative for uh, 3CE? So the 3CE is organized with two different boards. There's the policy board, which sets the rates and approves the budget. And then there's the operations board. And we approve the contracts and kind of oversee the general manager. I'm on the operations board. And Councilmember Brooks is on the policy board. 
Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> The meetings are now in person. Well, they're supposed to be in person. Yep. They're down at the Monterey, so they're, Ooh, which is yeah. a lot closer for us than it is for Santa Barbara. True. Yeah. Oh, true. Yeah. All right. Here. Now the most interesting part of the presentation, the Brown Act. <laughs> With your handheld mic. I know, Get right? Ready. Yeah. <laughs> um, should I sing it? Is that what you're going to suggest? Like, yeah. And interpret sing. it. Damn. And sing. Um, <laughs> So, nothing more awesome <laughs> on our rainy Thursday night than a discussion of the Brown Act and Complex Public Records Act. I feel like I have told all of you about this until I'm blue in the face, and you probably know it. So, I'm going to blow through the basics and go over some things that I feel like come up all the time with a lot of councils. And so, hopefully, it'll be useful to you. Um, if not, it'll be over soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Brown Act, what you really need to know about the Brown Act is on the dais, stick to the agenda. Off the dais, don't have a meeting, which is a meeting means three of you talk about something that could come before the council. Pretty broad, right? Um, conflicts. What you need to know is if you think you have a conflict with anything on the agenda, let me, Jamie, and Julia know as soon as possible. Um, I will say especially me, because usually conflicts, while to you, may seem really simple, they're actually really complicated to research, and we have, it takes, it can sometimes take three or four hours to research, and so we have to find that time. So please, please, please tell us as soon as you do. We'll probably have some factual information, or factual questions for you, and then we'll send you an email telling you whether we think you have a conflict. Public Records Act, what you need to know is that now you, that you are unelected, you are the city. So anything, any communication that you have in writing, uh, whether it be on your Gmail account, your Hotmail account, um, your whatever, AOL, whatever, text. <laughs> Who here still has a Hotmail account? Oh, oh. I, I just would like oh. to say I hope, I hope my <laughs> husband is watching now. Um, it's all public, right? It's all because you were doing the people's business. So if we get a records request, for any of that information, we will be contacting you and saying, please pull all those communications. What a lot of council members do and what is a good practice is to have all of your city business conducted on your city email account. Um, okay, next. Non-agendized items. Um, in general, Everything that you talk about up there needs to be on the agenda. There are some exceptions. You can briefly respond to public statements or ask questions of members of the public during public comment. Usually, we don't recommend that, even though the Brown Act says that it is lawful, because it's difficult to know what briefly means in the Brown Act, um, and it's a good way to stray from the agenda. Um, you can, like I said, you can ask a question for clarification. You can make a brief announcement. That's why we have that item on the agenda for council member announcements. We don't have to state the specific announcement that you will be making. It's a surprise to all of us. Um, and you can ask, uh, as we, as you have done in the past, you can ask to have a matter put on a future agenda. Next. You can also add an emergency item to the agenda. I spent some time on my slides on emergencies. That seems to be appropriate these days. Um, there are two different ways in which you can add emergency item to the agenda. One is the standard is similar to what I think is going to be discussed later in the presentation for calling an emergency meeting. And that is, there is a really dire emergency happen, happening. And so it's hard to imagine, practically, these circumstances, because if there is a really dire emergency, I don't know that you'd be having a council meeting, but assume that you are. Assume that the agenda has gone out between the time that the agenda goes out and the time that you are sitting here, there is a dire emergency and you need to talk about that item. Then you can say, I would like this put on the agenda, there is a dire emergency. It requires only a majority vote of the council to put on the agenda. Second scenario is, it's not necessarily a dire emergency as defined by the government code, but it is an item that is important to be discussed immediate, immediately because there is a need for immediate action. And the agency, which is not just you, it's all of the staff, didn't know about it until after the agenda went out. In that case, it requires a supermajority vote. 
I think these things happen so, so rarely. Um, I just tell you, uh, just to, a little trivia. Okay, next. Alrighty, of course you've done. Okay, um, this is a question that comes up somewhat often, so I think a refresher is helpful. If you are disqualified from voting on an item or participating in an item because you have a conflict, you are disqualified from the entire item. You cannot participate in the debate and or the discussion or public comment and then recuse from the vote. You need to be out of the entire item. And it's not just the item on the agenda. It's communicating with staff about it in advance, communicating with your fellow council members, communicating with planning commissioners about it. You're out of the entire item. Okay? Mm -hmm. Next. Avoiding bias. There are two ways in which you serve the community as a council member. One is through making legislative, serving in your legislative function. That is what the council does most of the time. Um, I think every item on the agenda tonight is you acting your, in your legislative function. That is usually what you're doing. You're making ordinances. You are directing staff. The flag policy is an example. You're making a policy or adopting an ordinance that applies to the entire community or a large portion of the community. At times, you will sit in your quasi-judicial or adjudicatory uh, function. In that case, you are essentially acting as a judge. So you are ruling on an appeal in most cases, or you are issuing, you're ruling on an appeal of a permit issuance. In that case, your decision affects one person or a small, small number of people, like an applicant that may be four people. If you are acting in your quasi-judicial capacity as a judge, just like any other judge, it's important that you not be biased. And so what can create bias is saying in the community, I support this project. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure this project is not approved or is approved. You can kind of use your common sense on that. If And if you have any questions, you can certainly ask me or Jamie or Julia. Um, if it, you do show bias in the community, you would need to recuse yourself from discussion of the item. It's most important that you watch bias in your quasi, if you're, if it's a decision that's in the quasi-judicial capacity. Bias in the legislative capacity, on decisions regarding your legislative capacity, it, it, it's not as critical. I mean, you are elected to have opinions because you have opinions. So it, it is not as critical if you say before this meeting, I really support option one on the flag policy. You're sitting in your legislative capacity. It's not as important. There are no due process rights at issue. Okay, next. Remote appearances. I'm going to blow through this because I know that um, I've gone over it a couple times. Uh, AB 361, the law that allowed the council to remote into meetings um, during the pandemic has expired. We now have two options. You can either appear under the traditional Brown Act rules or um, the rules under AB 2449. The main distinction here is whether or not you need to post on the agenda the address from which you are appearing. So the bottom line here is if you would like to appear remotely, please, please let me know in advance and I can work with you on which of these procedures might make sense. If, for instance, you are appearing from a conference, you may want to use AB 2449 um, because you're fine posting the address of your hotel on the agenda. That's no big deal. Um, it's one of the reasons that you can appear remotely under that legislation. If, for instance, you are not feeling well and you are appearing from home, um, you may, actually, I had that backwards. If you're appearing from a conference, you are probably fine posting, so you want to use the traditional Brown Act rules. If you are appearing from home because you're sick or you've got a sick kid, in that case, you may want to use the new rules because you are not required to post your home address and allow public comment at your home. I mean, I know um, if, you know, in some places... It, I live in the city. If I posted a um, notice on my door and invited the public in for public comment, they might come in for public comment. So 
you can think about that and I can work with you on what might work best for you. Next, <clears throat> parliamentary procedure. That's not me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Over here. <laughs> Go, Julia. Oh, I can cover it, Julia. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Okay. Yes. Well, I don't know that the clicker is super. It's a work in progress. <laughs> it worked earlier today. So the city of Capitol has been using Rosenberg's rules of order as parliamentary procedure for meetings since 2007. The key points of this procedure is that this is how you would process motions and seconds. Um, this is how you can conduct amendments to motions. If somebody makes a motion and somebody else wants to amend it, you would make a friendly amendment. Um, you can substitute motions. If one person makes a motion and another person wants to change the motion entirely, you can do a substitute motion. You can also call the question, which calls for an immediate end discussion and calls for a vote. Or you can call for a point of order, which would make a clarification during the motion. Can you, Julia, can you? Just, I love the call the question a point of order. Can you just give us briefly? Like an example? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Example. So do you want to talk? Sure, I, I feel bad at night. Oh no, it's totally I fine. Too. <laughs> yeah. But you're doing great. Um, so to call the question, so for example, if there was a discussion happening and there was a motion on the floor, um, and discussion was continuing to happen after the motion was on the floor, then one council member could call the question, which would end discussion on the item and trigger the vote for the item. And so there would have to be a vote and the motion would either pass or fail. And if the motion was to fail, then the discussion would continue again until an alternate motion was made. Perfect. I think I would just add that I think it requires a supermajority. Anything in Rosenberg's rules that basically makes people stop talking requires a super majority. Yeah, you have to vote to call the question, right? You can't just go straight to the vote on the motion. You have to vote yeah, to call yeah. the question, yeah. and then you vote on the, the motion. The vote to call the question is four-fifths. Yeah. And then point of order. You want to tackle this one? Point of order, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a vote on a point of order. I've just seen a, seen a council member say sort of point of order, we should be doing this this way. And it's exact, I've seen it used exactly like it sounds, like point of order, um, we should be uh, getting public comment before we debate this item. Or point of order, there is a substitute motion on the floor, shouldn't we vote on that before um, something else? I don't feel like I see a lot of point of orders here. It just sounds so mean. It does sound quite aggressive. Mm, but, yeah. but you have I a very like engaged city attorney and city manager, yeah. so you may not need points of order. I'll also make a note that the city has adopted a code of conduct for our council members, which we're going to talk about later in this presentation. And the code of conduct does kind of outline procedures for how council members should treat each other's staff and other members of the community. So point of order could also call to and you know, discussion that's maybe not in line with the code of conduct. Julia, could you also um, briefly talk about substitute motions? Because I know that sometimes there's some confusion about is that a motion that you'll vote on after, if you'll vote on first, and how that works if someone makes a motion and then someone makes a substitute motion? Yeah, I can do that. So um, usually the substitute motion, um, it, the order of the motion, order of the vote, it goes in reverse order. So there's an original motion and then there's a substitute motion. The substitute motion is voted on first. And at times a substitute motion will obviate the need for the original motion, which is why it's done in reverse order. Same with an, a friendly amendment, is, or same, I guess an amended motion is the same as a substitute motion. So yeah, reverse order. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Cool. The one thing I was gonna add on point of order, I think the few times I've seen it, it really is like, it's sort of a way to interrupt if you're not there. Like, if you're sitting over there and you're like, I don't think we've gone to public comment. Mm -hmm. And you can just sort of like grab your bike and kind of interrupt and just say point of order and it, it kind of gives you the floor. Um, so it isn't necessarily an aggressive thing. It can just be like a, hey, Which is are we on track here? You know, that kind of thing. Versus doing this. <laughs> well, you could, uh, yes, that, that also works. Which I need every meeting, which yeah. is fine. <laughs> All right. Were there any other questions? All right, yeah. moving along. So you all are familiar with our city council agendas by now, but just to briefly cover the different types of meetings that you might see, I think so far this year we've seen two of these, maybe almost three, 
but basically there are regular meetings which are scheduled in advance. This meeting calendar is adopted at the end of the year for the following year. The agendas for regular meetings are published at least 72 hours ahead of the meeting in accordance with the Brown Act. Items address a variety of topics, but general business for the city. And in Capitola, the city council meets on second and fourth Thursdays at 6 p.m., which is a recent change to this city council meeting calendar. The other type of meeting is a special meeting. Sometimes special meetings are planned in advance, like the budget hearings that were adopted recently, or sometimes they can be um, scheduled last minute. The time requirement for agendas for special meetings is actually only 24 hours ahead of time. So a meeting could be scheduled on Monday and then held on Wednesday and the agenda would be published in accordance with the Brown Act. Special meetings are typically scheduled to cover a single issue. So a workshop or a time sensitive item. And the third kind of meeting, which Samantha touched on earlier, is an emergency meeting. And these are very rare and critical and are usually scheduled with less than 24 hours notice. Um, and these are meant to address threats that pose immediate threat or concern to the health and safety of the community. And the city council would have to take immediate action to approve something. Can, can I ask you a quick question about agendas? Sure. If there's an edit to the agenda um, after it goes out, does that update get sent directly to council? Do we get the updates? So it depends on the type of edit. There is like a provision within the Brown Act, I believe that if there's like a very small, like a typo was corrected on the agenda, then there's a, an allowance for small edits like that. But if there was a substantive change to the content of the agenda, then it would have to be republished and re-sent out to um, like everyone that's on our receival list for the agenda. So as you already know, we do have sometimes closed sessions and these closed session meetings are closed to the public, though we do open the meeting in public session, the council then adjourns and goes to another location to conduct the closed session business. The closed session is usually directly prior to open session or regular meetings. Only specific items qualify for closed session. Um, the most common closed session topics are litigation, real estate negotiations, personnel issues, or labor negotiations and disclosure of confidential information from these sessions is a misdemeanor. Um, for example, I included the closed session language from tonight, which you guys are all familiar with. I'm not gonna cover too much of this because by now you've seen many of our agendas, so the agenda structure should be pretty familiar for you. Um, but I did wanna mention that staff recently in the past couple years did undergo an effort to streamline the agenda process and make sure that time limits were set for some of the items like presentations or oral communications or staff and city council comments. This was based partly on city council direction to staff as that um, at the time, because the meetings were starting later, the time it took to finally get to like the meat of the item ate into everybody's evening, not only city council members and staff, but also members of the public who were in attendance who wanted to hear or participate on a certain item. So in an effort to address that, staff has made changes to streamline the agenda structure, making presentations limited to eight minutes, staff and city council comments three minutes each, and oral communications on off agenda items or consent calendar items three minutes each. So the consent calendar, as you're all familiar with now, all items are adopted with one vote. There's no presentation or discussion required. However, items can be pooled at a city council member's discretion or sometimes by staff. And then general government items or public hearing items, each item follows a procedure that's outlined in our agenda. There's a staff presentation, time for council questions, and then public comment. And the reason why council questions occur before public comment is that the council may have a question that the public would also wanna know an answer to. So it kind of helps to combat duplicative questions. Um, following public comment, there is council deliberation and then a vote. For the oral communication portion of the agenda, this section is really targeted for things um, outside of the jurisdiction of legislative body or for not items listed on the agenda. However, members of the public could also use this time to comment on agenda items that are in the consent calendar to avoid having them pulled from the consent calendar. Um, public comment on agenda items that are listed on the agenda is required prior to council vote. And right now we do have Zoom and in-person participation for our members of the public. When it comes to public comment on agenda items or off agenda items, members of the public have a lot of um, leeway as to what they can say. The only things that would really be prohibited during a council meeting is something that's disruptive to the meeting or disrupts the meeting or something that is 
I believe the language is like a harmful, like something harmful oh, or inciting violence. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are really the only two limitations as to what somebody could say during a meeting. And when it comes to responding to public comment, um, I believe Sam touched on this earlier, but basically comments are a part of the record of the meeting um, and remarks should be addressed to the council as a body and not to a specific council member. City council members aren't required to respond to public comment and shouldn't engage in a discussion with members of the public if they come up here and have a comment. Um, but a statement could be provided, I think is what Sam mentioned earlier, or um, direction to staff could be provided as a part of the city council member discussion. Can I jump in on this really quickly? Sure. Just on the what's allowed and what's not. Um, there's actually some pretty famous litigation, I think, in the city of Santa Cruz about a Nazi salute. Yeah. Allowed. A Nazi salute allowed. Yeah, it has to be actually disrupting the meeting. It has to be, that was allowed, but someone um, turning to the audience and getting the audience um, to chant was <laughs> not allowed. It is really about an actual disruption of the meeting. Yeah, so that's one of the things, is somebody coming up here and saying how horrible your city manager is and saying, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was picking on me here, but, but that, that, is, that is allowed. And, you know, I know council members have struggled with that before when somebody is making very direct personal attacks, but personal attacks are really in bounds. Inciting violence or making it so we can't do the meeting. Yeah. But couldn't we ask them, so we have you a three-minute thing up there after they're done we can ask them to leave and if they don't leave that's disruptive and then they can be escorted out correct yeah if they're not following the direction and they're not letting the meeting proceed there is also a section of the municipal code that addresses remarks to the city council so there is like a little bit of guidance there as well and, and then the last one of the responding to public comment my, my recommendation you may have somebody up there that makes really has some really good questions that they pose my recommendation is always to let, let let the public come in and then as a council member, staff staff won't just start answering. You know, it's your meeting, it's the council's meeting, we're looking for direction from the mayor. But if when public comment is closed, if you think that there's some items that deserve a response, you're more than welcome to turn to staff and say, we, during public comment, we heard a number of good questions about X. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can get a quick response staff? That's totally in bounds, totally appropriate. I'd recommend waiting until somebody sits back down um, because when they're standing there and then you ask for a response from me or you give it yourself, it's very easy then. Usually what I see is the person with the mic then up there then say, well, what about, you know, this situation? What about, so pretty quickly you're in a debate. Mm -hmm. Were there any other questions before we move on? All right, thanks. So going over some basics for the agenda, um, agenda items are for council to act on as a topic or to discuss an issue at length. Each item must be on a published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act. This does include items that require no action. So for example, if you are to accept a presentation or present a proclamation, those also need to be agendized. How to put items on the agenda. So there are two ways that items can be agendized. The city manager has the discretion to put items on the agenda during the regular course of business. But in accordance with Capitola Municipal Code, you can also request at an open council meeting for an item to be agendized at a later date. So any person um, on the city council can request an agenda item during a regular or um, like an open meeting. The requirements to add an item to the agenda um, during the meeting or after the agenda is published, um, we talked a bit about this prior, but it's basically for emergency situations or things that require action prior to the next meeting. And then in terms of organizing the agenda or where items are placed on the agenda, this is something that the uh, city manager works with staff on. Certain items are, require public noticing or a public hearing. So staff is making sure that we're tracking legal requirements to ensure that those public noticing requirements are met. And those items fall under the general government or public hearing section. Other items when possible can be approved on consent, which requires less discussion. Um, and those are more regular routine business items. Some possible council actions could include providing direction to staff, uh, making a motion to authorize or approve an item, 
things that often come up on city council agendas are resolutions and ordinances and resolutions are formal adoption of policy changes, changes to the budget. Occasionally they can involve um, formal adoption of like a large contract or things like that. Um, the most legislative action the city council can do is introduce and adopt ordinances which pro, um, introduce changes to the municipal codes, so the laws of the city. Um, ordinances are required to be introduced and then adopted at a subsequent meeting and become effective 30 days after adoption or there are emergency or urgency ordinances which would have more immediate action and are followed up with a regular adoption of an ordinance at a later date. So now switching gears from the agenda, we're gonna move on to the code of conduct and other applicable administrative policies for the city council. And some of these were included in your agenda packet. But to start off, um, administrative policy I-42 is the code of conduct. This policy was originally developed in 2020 and then adopted in 2021. It works in conjunction with legal requirements for the city council. So legal requirements regarding the ethics or like regular trainings that are required or code of conduct that is required. I mean, it outlines core values for city council members and appointed officials to city advisory bodies. And there are procedures outlined to investigate violations of the standards and penalties outlined for those violations within the policy. This code of conduct policy provides transparency and allows for standards for decision making for our elected and appointed officials. There are standards for relations with other council members for decorum at public meetings. There are standards for communications with the public, boards and commissions, other governmental agencies, staff and media. And it establishes standards for how city council and appointed officials are expected to interact with staff. Um, all members of our city advisory bodies are provided a copy of this policy and are expected to sign it along with our city council members and the signed copies are made a part of like the administrative record for each group. So we have them on file. Um, I think all of yours are also available to you on net file, which you use for your code or conflict of interest filings. Some other administrative policies that are applicable are the technology reimbursement policy, which came up at a recent meeting. This is policy V10. Council members who elect to go paperless and sign this policy may receive an annual reimbursement for a digital reading device or software to receive agenda materials or city materials. So for example, if you elected to go paperless and purchase an iPad, you could receive an annual reimbursement amount um, in exchange for that effort to be more environmentally conscious. The other administrative policy that is um, important here is policy I-31 regarding abstentions. Council members are prohibited from participating in governmental decisions that may have a material financial effect on their economic interests, including his or her personal finances. However, noting that council members should not abstain from a vote to avoid casting a controversial vote. And so this policy was really um, crafted to help make sure that council members are participating in discussion and then not backing away from the vote at the last minute um, and making sure that everyone is casting a vote appropriately. Julia, just to uh, clarify, um, personal finances include your spouse as well, correct? Correct, so anything that would be outlined on your conflict of interest filing. And with that, if there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Chloe to talk about our other policies. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you so much, Julia. So we're gonna talk briefly on how to appropriately use social media. I know it's very exciting again. Um, so this is touched on earlier by our fabulous attorney, but it's worth mentioning again, that there are different types of hearings, right? So most commonly you're gonna be working as a legislative body. So you'll be establishing policy and rules for groups of people or property. But however, occasionally you might be in your quasi judicial function, which means you're acting like a judge. You might be applying a rule or um, pr approving a permit for one business or one person. So a good question to ask yourself if you're confused is are you affecting one person or the whole city and that kind of leads you to what kind of act function you're serving under that's important because whether or not an item is quasi judicial or legislative you would treat it differently on social media so that's what we're going to talk about now we have this handy dandy chart which was included in the policy and in your packet and it outlines kind of the different ways you can behave on social media and if they're acceptable or if they're against the policy. So 
There's a lot of behavior on social media that is completely fine. It's almost encouraged by um, elected officials at this point, and I'm going to have examples. So there's acceptable behaviors, and generally speaking, I think um, certainly the five of you and most of our elected officials and appointed officials are using social media to their advantage to just push out information, spread the word about programming. That's great. We love that. Thank you. Keep doing it. Okay, moving into what's a little iffy and what could get into being against the policy is if you're sharing or posting on quasi-digital items. So for example, one specific um, permit to one business, all of a sudden you start posting, hey guys, there's an item coming up about a very specific situation that only affects one person. And by the way, I never post about this ever, but right now I am. That's fishy, so maybe don't do that. That would help us all. But if you do start doing that, you may need to then submit all of that ex parte communication to the city, such like same way you would for um, additional materials. So even if it's technically allowed, it's a lot of extra work. So you may just decide not to do that. Um, and then when we get into being against the policy, again, I'll have examples. If you're expressing your personal opinion about a quasi-judicial matter. So for example, if before a public meeting, you're expressing your personal opinion being against a, um, a housing project, before the meeting, before the public meeting, before your vote, you've basically shown your bias before you've held your public meeting and learned from staff and accepted public comment. So that's really against the policy. And in that case, you may need to recuse from the vote at all. So we're gonna go through some examples and I believe we can even get a little interactive here. This is an example of a post about a Capitola recreation movie night. Do we wanna guess? You can just yell out, Is where does this fall on our scale of acceptable or not? Acceptable. I love that, acceptable, perfect, correct. I think you can see the word. This is one of our posts, technically, but if you wanted to share that, that would be great. Yeah. And then here's another example, some information about, it's very um, pertinent for this evening, a, a weather pattern coming in. Again, you could probably guess, totally fine to share that. That would be really nice engagement on social media. Now here we're getting into another example. Say you've posted this, this is a picture. What do you think about this park project on 12th Street? Leave your comments here. I'm seeing shaking, questionable, I'm liking what I'm seeing, correct, discouraged. And really the reason is because, oh, both popped up, but depending on your patterns on social media, if you really never post about anything and all of a sudden here you are posting about a very specific project, it's just a little bit fishy. You're kind of treating an item differently than others. And our result, as I said, and Jamie's gonna jump in, I can tell, <laughs> uh, you may need to then submit all the communication. So that's your post and any comments, you know how it can get. That, that could be hundreds of comments that we now need to include in our record. So just be aware of that. And yes, please, city manager, go right ahead. The, the, the other reason why, why the policy says that it's discouraged is really, um, it's a little bit about protecting council members because the notion is like, we have a process you know, we come to a meeting, the public is here, you're gonna receive the staff presentation, you're gonna hear from the public, and then you're gonna render a decision. And so I would always counsel, not always, I mean, there's certain situations where, you know, you can say ahead of time, you know, for example, if you have a specific thing that you're gonna push for funding for the budget, I think that can be fine to sort of advertise. But in general, if it's like telling people how you're gonna vote on something ahead of time, it can lead people to the assumption that you don't care maybe what's gonna happen or you're not going to listen to your peers, for example, if the neighbor mm -hmm. can argue about a different approach. And how about just general information? City Council is going to be meeting this Thursday, and we're going to be discussing this, this, and this. Come voice your thoughts to us. Stuff like that. Yeah, That's I great. mean, consistency is the key there, number yes. one. And then I think, you know, it's the, the problem, the only problem, and I'm going to turn it over to Sam, jump on me if I'm wrong here, is if you never had done that before and it was like, on the appeal hearing night for gnarly project X. okay but i'm just on a normal council night yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> chloe um you might get to a slide about this but are you going to talk about comments so i just think about this as discouraged because a person a council member might feel it necessary to respond to one of those comments which then is 
Brown Act. Is yeah. A, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's I don't know right. If you were going to show slides on that. I just didn't want to take I was going to jump in, but yeah, I didn't want to interrupt Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Um, I, I, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, this is a really good way to violate the Brown Act, right? That right. To, you should really refrain from commenting on other council members' posts on social media. And even with the public on mm -hmm. items that could potentially be on an agenda, right? Because you don't want to like publicly um, respond. show bias in, mm -hmm. in any sense. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, is this just for quasi judicial or for all agenda items that we're not allowed to show bias and from That's a legal all. perspective? Okay, so, okay, so it, the Brown Act issue applies to all items. The So if someone posted um, a legislative item. If someone posted, mm -hmm. if Vice Mayor Brown posted, we are discussing the flag policy at tonight's meeting, mm -hmm. come and tell us your thoughts. Uh, you responded and Councilmember Brooks responded. Right. That could be a Brown Act violation. What? The bias issue is more of an issue with adjudicative items. So, but that's a separate issue than I a Brown Act. I guess my issue. question is so, say, I posted online before this meeting. Um, I don't think we should adopt the new flag policies as recommended or something about um, non uh, yeah. judicatory. Um, That's a legislative item. Yeah, right? on a yep. legislative item. Mm. There, is there um, is there laws against that? Yeah. So I, I understand your question. Mm -hmm. I think you're asking, can I show bias on an on a legislative item exactly. in advance of the meeting? And legally, mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes. And that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. Legally, legally. the answer is yes. So, what Jamie said is right. You know, usually council members don't do that for it's more for political reasons. But legally, what the law is concerned with is you not showing bias on quasi-judiciary items. So from my side, I'm concerned with you not showing bias on quasi-judiciary items because, or whatever. It's called, it's called different things in different court cases. Sometimes it's quasi-judiciary. But as long as it's relating to the general public, it is legally fine to legally, post whatever opinions you have. Yeah, like I said, I. I'm hesitating because it's such a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was going to be my follow up. Yeah, it's like I, I'm not um, fully understanding what the negative aspect of forming an opinion publicly on an item is, if not legal ramifications. Yeah, so I, I understand your question. Because I mean, I, it's like as a politician, you run on certain ideologies and beliefs. So why would you not publicly express those opinions if they're going to be? You know, I think it's just more about at the meeting. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's more about a specific <laughs> item. You can say like I'm pro affordable housing, but then if a housing item is coming before council, I think it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in general it's like kind of appropriate to say I've always been for affordable housing. This particular item's coming to us tomorrow, and then it's wise not to say and I'm going to vote for it until the public comment has been heard and we've heard the staff presentation because I think the general idea is that public comment. Mm -hmm. that we are here to make our decisions based on what we hear from staff and the public and that we're making decisions in the best interest of the public. And so if we don't get public comment ahead of time, we're just saying, I've already decided what I'm going right. to do. Um, well, and and that's just also, what I'm, I'm always interested to see what everybody actually has to say yeah. based on each item to help mold a decision. If, if I'm on the fence about something or I don't know, like, you know, you, you're, you can bring all of your support of ideas here and this is to me more of like the public forum rather than social media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a way yeah. the one other important thing to understand about this this policy the last policy the code of conduct and then i guess the other one the abstentions policy those are your rules for yourself mm -hmm. so saying it's discouraged it's Samantha, Samantha's outlining the legal issues with, you know, expressing an opinion or a bias about a specific issue. I'm explaining sort of political uh, ramifications or process issues. But then also this policy has been adopted by the council that says, look, we are discouraging this sort of thing. So that's... Oh, okay. So this is, um, came from a previous council 
to label this behavior as discouraged. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. So this, this policy, policy, I don't know the number off the top of my head, basically it was trying to go through and saying, hey, look, this type of stuff, we encourage it as a city, as a city council, we say this is good, sharing information. Uh, expressing bias, though, is discouraged because mm -hmm. while not technically illegal, it can get you in the city potentially in trouble. So that was kind of the council's. That's where... With the genesis of this when you say it could get me in the city potentially in trouble, what? So, most specifically, what I could imagine a situation is is when you say I'm going to vote X. You know, you post on your on the gram, say right. I'm going to vote mm -hmm. like X, and then and then people look and say, wait a second, he's not listening to the public. We're all coming to the meeting, and sort of agree. And yeah, and that's yeah, trouble, um, political trouble. Exactly. Right, got it. Yeah. Thank and you. that so the next example <laughs> relates to that a lot I would I would say Julia do you mind <laughs> I just got angry with the, the clicker so this is kind of Sorry. it's exactly that and more because this is a quasi judicial item on top of everything but basically if you're posting about an affordable housing project you're you're against it come to the meeting and tell us why I'm planning on voting no I think you can guess that is against the policy right and the reasoning again is because you're showing your bias, you're showing your opinion, how you're gonna vote before the public meeting, before the forum, before hearing public comment, et cetera, as we've already discussed. And in that case, you would likely need to recuse, which basically means you don't get to do what you were elected to do, which is vote. <laughs> so that's also trouble. Um, really, that's the last example. It's great to hear lots of questions and interest in this. Do we have more? Um, we want to talk about with social media at this point. Okay. <laughs> I'm open for questions. I guess I'm just um, curious about the Brown Act. Um, so because like if I did post an opinion about a, I'm sorry, what was it? Non legislative. legislative yeah. uh, on a legislative item and the other say and then you know, maybe one of the other council members sees that and then they post not necessarily as part of a conversation, but, you know, maybe it could look like that, their opinion. Is that going to be a violation of the Brown Act? Is that something as seen as some form of communication, even though it's public if there's, if on it's social on media? Yeah. If it's on your post? Yeah, but if, if two council not, members post on your post, and that's, that's likely a Brown Act violation. If, if, if they're I posting say, on like their I'm own, pro housing, and another council member says I'm anti housing, uh, that wouldn't be considered any form of discussion. Likely not. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I want to say one more thing about this example about why this is such a bad idea. In addition to what's listed, if the city gets sued by an applicant or an appellant on a quasi-judicial decision that you make. The lawsuit is generally a writ, which is a truncated lawsuit, which, and the only thing that the court really considers is the record, which is all of the written, all of the stuff, mm -hmm. all the information that has been generated on that item until it gets, before it gets to court. In that case, this post would likely be a part of the record. And that is just not what we want to be the record for our city. That's a great point, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. I think this is, I've got the handle on the, the tech here. So moving on, we've talked about a lot of different policies that again, that was a good distinction our city manager made. We've discussed council member like policies that the council themselves have adopted and approved. So they're about yourselves. Now we wanted to discuss some potential administrative policies, um, new policies that you may want to pursue based on feedback we've had um, that staff has heard from council members. So really there's just one in particular uh, regarding council training and travel. And <laughs> I've... I want to cry. <laughs> um, so this is something that we have a very um, 
understood practice between council and staff, but it's not been formalized in a policy. So just to kind of reiterate, and this is using numbers that were suggested in the goals meeting recently, so would potentially be in effect for the 2023-24 budget upon your vote on the budget, of course. Um, Basically, we would be functioning with $15,000 total for council travel and training. The understanding is that means each of you have 3,000 and there's no sharing between members for the fiscal year. Now, it seems reasonable that maybe it would be a good idea to have these understandings written down in a formal, formal policy. So some other um, kind of points to consider that we would then put into a draft and bring for your approval at a later meeting are here on the screen um, based on other jurisdictions policies and things that have come up in conversation so would you want to have any requirements around out of state tra travel to trainings would that mean maybe council needs to approve out of state travel do you want to have a report to council after are there parameters around the kinds of training and activities that qualify for reimbursement there, believe me, I've read literally policies that are nine, 10 pages on this kind of stuff. So it might be surprising, but we could get really detailed or just general. It's up to up to the five of you and um, any other kind of specifics around, uh, you know, hotel rates, anything that you might want to be regulating. So I'm really just here to take notes and hear what you'd like and then bring a draft back. And of course, if our city manager has anything to add, please do. I think I got everything in there. With the mobile bike. All too apparent, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's your job. It's your job. <laughs> oh no! Call, I call your bluff. It's gonna speak again. So, so this came about actually when I was briefing Councilmember Peterson. We were talking about the travel and training, and and we were going through these things. And I was explaining that in general, the travel and training it can be very broad for any sort of type of training for a new council member, experienced council member, whether it's a league event, it's a local conference, all kinds of things. Um, and I mentioned that in general, we haven't ever used the funding for, and I call them galas, but like, you know, Red Cross is hosting a $500 flight dinner or something like that. That's not really about training. That's about kind of fundraising and networking. And so it seems prudent, frankly, that we would have that written down. Because if that's the way the council wants this budget to be used, it seems like it's better to have it written down rather than um, up to me to sort of be the gatekeeper. Because it's not the best role for your city manager. The out-of-state travel that's one idea would be to have council approval for out of state travel. I don't, I can't remember a time that I've had a council member go out of state, but the notion there would be that it would just go on consent agenda. So if you're going to go out of state, you just need to be comfortable with the world knowing that you plan to go to the league mayor's conference in Orlando, Florida. Oh, when we get a sister city in the Bahamas and we want to travel, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. that's where we need to write this policy. Yeah. Very clear that it and allows for that travel. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's the kind of thing, right? Because you could say you want to go to the Bahamas for a conference about parks, right? A one-day conference in the Bahamas or something. And so the question is, <laughs> that would be one mechanism by which you just make sure that the council is approving that travel. I think, Samantha, the, in Watsonville, the council approves all travel and training for all council members? They do that okay. in San Jose. And I don't recommend that. I think that that can lead to just a lot of clutter on the agenda. And it would be better to just say if it's in-state and it's travel and training and it's not galas, it's good. Uh, and then if it's out of state, which, like I said, I can't remember seeing this in the past. So it doesn't come up often. I and tried it. it. You no, <laughs> said no. Like and we don't need to do it. We can stick with the current format. Um, but like I said, it, it, as I told Councilmember Peterson when he asked the question, it's not written down. That, that's kind of an uncomfortable position to have just sort of a loose understanding that I have to tell council members here's what it is. This is open member. for discussion now? Yeah, absolutely. Any direction. I'm taking notes. Well, wait, quest, quest, are we in questions? Do we have to go to public comment? Do you want are we in questions or comments? This is just direction. There isn't like an approval or a motion. Okay. So I think you can just chat if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong. So if you would want staff to bring this back to council you could for the probably whole item, ask yeah. for it at this point but we can't discuss it too much because it's not on the agenda oh we can we want to agenda dive in i i think it would be nice to have some sort of uh, guidance on 
what types of training and activities would qualify and maybe maybe even specifics on hotel rates um i would don't think there's anything i think bad. i think that's within reason i i would personally hesitate to have a requirement for out of state training and travel because i think it's very common to go out of state it's very relatively inexpensive to go out of state for different travel or training purposes um so i just think it would be unnecessary to bring that back to council in my personal opinion i think it, it would be best left up to the um decision of the individual council member i mean yeah there's only there's not very far you can go with i mean three grand a year well, that would probably be your entire year's worth of travel and training if you were to go to an out-of-state conference i mean i could see value going even out of country honestly my, my experience with most most out cities out of country i think is different than out of state yeah most cities and counties have policies where they they have to get it ask ask for permission to go out of state for yeah. training because of how, how much how costly it is so a couple of cities or counties that i've worked with you always had to have permission so it wouldn't be a bad idea to have to be a vote in the city council if you went well wait to clarify we're county. not getting any additional money no for if it becomes no. a costly trip we're not getting additional funds to cover it we just we get our three grand and that's it right exactly i think it would be nice to like identify the intent of what council travel is okay right? so once we establish what these funds are for and identify what the definition of council travel is so to staff's point earlier it excludes at a high level networking and galas and really anything to take your political <laughs> stature you know this would have to be council work i mean in my eyes this would have to be in relation to council related stuff so i think for me if some language was supposed to come back is a clear definition of what council training is mm -hmm. and then i mean i think what you get in trouble with is specifying overnight stays and hotel rates it's a constant thing you'd have to update mm -hmm. and change over from city to state to country um so i don't have one way or another i don't that's not something i that's i'm worried about it's just more about identifying the real like nature of council travel and the purpose of it mm -hmm. and for me it would be something that would um that where we are a um, reflection of the city and that the information that we obtain through the travel is a, we're then acting as a resource and an information post to bring back to council so an example is like league we learn about brown act and code uh, and other things and policies and then we act as a resource when we return and we share that information with council mm -hmm. um you know so that's that's what i imagine for this kind of funds to be used and especially because it's public dollars and i think we have to really think about that legally as on what's legal in terms of using public dollars um for and i get i know there's some sort of things that can help us include in that you want it to be <laughs> you want it to be related to city business so that it is not a gift of public funds right i, I also want to note a minor apology that that the specifics about um hotel rates that's actually already contained so the city has a travel and train travel policy that applies to city time. staff and it's as uh, council member clark said you know specific requirements about being in state out of state kind of what those approvals are those don't apply to the council members but it does have like a max rate for a hotel and we use the <laughs> and gsa food and yeah, travel say, right. all that stuff the gsa reimbursement rates are what you get unless you're staying at a conference because a lot of times ho conferences um the host hotel is, is at a different rate so it says you can stay at the host hotel or you have to use the gsa rate whichever so that actually, the rates is actually already covered by the city's overall travel, but um, but this whole thing, Council Member Brooks's point about kind of saying what the intent is, because I have sort of in my own head, basically, I think Council Member Brooks, you articulated pretty much exactly what I would have said, um, but like having that written down, the council say, yeah, that's the purpose behind the travel and training budget. And then the other key question is like, 
would you want, as Councilmember Clark said, like something, if you go out of state, that there's additional approval, whether the mayor signs off on it, the full council, go out of the country, that triggers the additional review, or are we good as long as it's consistent? That's up to you. Yeah. I don't want to stifle anyone. I mean, Councilmember Peterson, if you want to go to another country and you're going to learn some cool stuff and bring it back to Council with the cool. use of public dollars, I'm behind that 100%, right? And I think if we can identify a clear definition of what those things are, I, I think that any of us could. And if you find a good deal... It could be a really applicable conference or, yeah. or training yeah. session. I mean, if it's yeah. like aviation... No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't technology. have <laughs> we don't have that stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, but I think that's where the challenge is, is just really identifying what is useful and yeah. what are some of the things we do here. And it's interesting because it, how you're talking about it, it makes it sound like you're almost going somewhere to gather information and then reporting it for the benefit of the whole council. Whereas I sort of interpreted it as you could go to like, you know, like the new city council training and it's so it's almost more professional development mm -hmm. so you as an individual would be able to perform your duties better as a city council member rather than necessarily reporting or for the benefit of the other city council I think it's members it's it's kind of i think it's a combination yeah. Yeah. It's a combination right. of that. it could be either yeah. i feel like professional development but, in the sense yeah. of being a public official yeah right? mm -hmm. yeah so exactly for the for the overall good of of yourself and the council and the community yeah, yeah yeah keep jamie in line keep jamie in line <laughs> there's an actual conference i don't think that. there's enough conferences <laughs> for that. i think in the bahamas <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> specifically We're all going i think i feel pretty comfortable with what you've all said do you, you have sure? anything else you want to add that was a lot. i'll bring we'll bring a draft back cool. for your approval so you'll have a chance of course to Perfect. see details Okay, thank you so much. And I think, um, shockingly, <laughs> that brings us to further questions and then um, that's really our big orientation for you. So thank you for your patience and all your contributions. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, do we need public comment for this? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody online? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, lost our attendee. Yeah, we, we got lost in our own world. <laughs> Uh, great. We don't need a roll call. We're good. Brings us to item 10, adjournment. Everybody stay safe. Stay home. Yeah. Stay still dry. Yep. It's still raining. Stay home. <laughs>